Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the calocrine kinin system. Okay, so we're just in the process of looking at type 1 activation of endothelial cells, and we're looking at how uh, type 1 activated endothelial cells will start to uh, recruit neutrophils from the blood. Okay, so upon type 1 activation, what happens is uh, you get fusion of the viable plate bodies uh, with the apical membrane of the endothelial cell, which puts P-selectin on the apical membrane of the endothelial cell. In addition, the endothelial cells start uh, producing platelet activating factor, sh shown here in blue, uh, which is a lipid molecule. Okay, so these two things allow the neutrophils to bind uh, to the apical membrane of the endothelial cells, whereas before the neutrophils would certainly not have stuck to the apical membrane of the endothelial cells. So it's only activated endothelial cells which have these molecules on their surface to which neutrophils can bind. Okay, so neutrophils have a uh, molecule, a ligand, which binds to P-selectin, and this is known as gl P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1, shown here in turquoise. Okay, so this is, let's put its name over here, this is P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1. And because that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, people often abbreviate P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1 uh, by its initials, PSGL1. Okay, so P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1, or PSGL1. Okay, and uh, they also have a uh, receptor for the platelet activating factor, which is nice and sensibly called the platelet activating factor receptor, or the PATH receptor. So PATH is short for platelet activating factor, and then it's just the platelet activating factor receptor. Right, and we'll colour in the platelet activating factor receptor in vivid purple. Okay, right. Uh, so. Basically, the interaction between P-selectin on the surface of the endothelial cell and the P-selectin glycoprotein ligand 1 uh, forms a very weak adhesion between the uh, neutrophil and the apical membrane of the endothelial cell, and this interaction is said to tether the neutrophil to the uh, endothelial cell, so this is called tethering, basically. Whereas the adhesion between the platelet activating factor receptor and the platelet activating factor on the endothelial cell is much tighter, basically. So it's called the tight adhesion between uh, the uh, neutrophil and uh, the endothelial cell. Okay, then what will happen is uh, the neutrophil will diapedes across the endothelium. So let me explain what diapedesis is. So if we've got these type 1 activated endothelial cells here, then we know we've had endothelial contraction. So we've got a little space between the uh, neighbouring endothelial cells now. And basically what's going to happen is the neutrophil is going to uh, squash its way uh, through this gap. So it's going to deform itself so that it can form a little sliver like this, which can squash through that gap. Uh, between the two neighbouring endothelial cells, okay? And this process of s almost slivering through the gap between two neighbouring endothelial cells is what's known as diapedesis. Okay, so uh, the neutrophil will diapedes across uh, the endothelium by going through the gaps between the endothelial cells. Okay, and then when the neutrophil gets into the interstitial space, uh, then what will happen is uh, that it will start phagocytosing the pathogens, so it will engulf the pathogens. Let me show this. So here is our um, neutrophil, and what will happen is it will engulf uh, the um, pathogen. Okay, so here I've just finished drawing its nucleus. Okay, so it will engulf the pathogen so that it's now within a uh, vesicle within the neutrophil. Okay, so here is our pathogen in red here. Okay, so what will happen is initially the microbe or pathogen will bind to the surface of the neutrophil, then the membrane will invaginate around that pathogen, it will pinch off and form this vesicle here. And this vesicle within which the uh, pathogen is contained is what's known as a phagosome. Okay, and then what will happen is you'll bring 
lysosomes, which are other membrane-bound uh, structures within the cytoplasm of the cell, which are full of uh, lytic enzymes uh, called lysozymes, okay? And uh, these lysozymes will break down the pathogen, basically, and digest it. Okay, so this is a way of destroying the pathogen. So uh, this isn't specific at all for the type of pathogen. It will do this to any old pathogen, basically. Uh, so therefore, this is part of the innate immune system because it's not targeted specifically to that pathogen. Okay, so that's type 1 activation now of endothelial cells. Let's now discuss what type 2 activation will do. And just to summarize, type 1 activation uh, will occur very, very quickly. It will occur in minutes, basically, and it's induced, remember, by this histamine. So you get vasodilatation, endothelial contraction, and neutrophil recruitment. Okay. Now, in type 2 activation, which is induced by the tumor necrosis factor alpha and the interleukin-1, released by uh, dendritic cells and resident macrophages, this will induce almost identical things to type 1 activation. Basically, type 2 activation really just um, helps type 1 activation. So, for instance, type 2 activation will also result in improved production of prostacyclin. So, type 2 activation, basically you'll produce um, enzymes which will help produce prostacyclin. So type 2 activation is totally and utterly about changing gene expression. Type 1 activation happened within minutes, so there was no changes to gene expression in type 1 activation. Everything just happened, uh, basically you just activated a whole bunch of things that were already there and made. Type 2 activation is everything. Everything occurs because of changes in gene expression. So. One thing that happens in type 2 activation is that your production of prostacyclin is going to go up. Okay, so it will increase your production of prostacyclin from type 1 activation. So remember, type 1 activated endothelial cells started producing uh, nitric oxide and prostacyclin. Basically, your production of prostacyclin will go up once you've had type 2 activation underway. Okay, so that will increase vasodilatation even more in the arterioles and therefore increase uh, blood supply to the affected area, causing redness and um, high temperature at that area. Okay, right. Uh, then it will actually cause permanent retraction of endothelial cells. So let me explain this. So it's also going to contribute to... Um, increased vascular permeability, but in a more extreme way than we um, obtained in type 1 activation. Okay, so in type 1 activation, we contracted those actin filaments which attached to the intracellular domains of uh, the proteins involved in the tight junctions and the adherens junctions, and that opened up a small gap in between neighboring endothelial cells. Now we're going to take a much more extreme uh, approach to um, opening up gaps between neighboring endothelial cells. So, basically, uh, what you have to acknowledge is what is actually keeping a cell in the shape that it usually adopts, okay? So, when drawing cells, generally we just draw the cell membrane like this. Uh, but when you actually think, what actually is holding a cell in the shape that it is in? Well, it's not the cell membrane. The cell membrane is just goo, basically. It's fat. It's this phospholipid bilayer. It's not rigid at all. So if you just have a cell membrane, it would, you know, be oscillating. It wouldn't have a fixed shape at all. So the reason cells have a fixed shape is that because uh, within their cytoplasm, there is a meshwork, basically, known as the cytoskeleton. So you have a huge number of protein fibres that are uh, everywhere, basically, within the cytoplasm, which forms a meshwork. And we don't often draw this, because if we did draw it, it would look something like this, okay? And, you know, it makes the picture useless, really. It just makes it a horrible mess, okay? But this is what the cytoskeleton would look like, fibres everywhere, basically, forming a mesh. And this is what holds the cell in its structure. Basically, the cell membrane is just sort of perched uh, around the cytoskeleton.
And two key things which the cytoskeleton is made up of are actin filaments and tubulin filaments. So actin and tubulin are the two key proteins which make up the cytoskeleton. They're actually very small proteins, uh, but you can polymerize them together to make actin filaments and tubulin filaments, which are huge, great strands. Okay, so this is the idea. If we can dismantle the actin and tubulin cytoskeleton in the terminal portions of these endothelial cells, okay, so if we dismantle the cytoskeleton over here in these portions that I've highlighted in blue, what will happen? Well, then the cell membrane has no reason to stay in that shape. It will collapse down, basically, to here. And the same for this endothelial cell here. So now, this portion of the endothelial cell highlighted in blue will be no longer existing. It won't exist anymore. So you've now got a massive great gap between these two endothelial cells. And this is what's going to happen in type 2 activated endothelial cells. So you'll get this retraction of the edges of the endothelial cell to open up uh, larger gaps between neighboring endothelial cells and increase vascular permeability even more. So again, this will help with the formation of an inflammatory exudate. Fluid will move from the blood into the interstitium of the affected site and this will bring in proteins, it'll bring in complement proteins, coagulation factors and the components of the calocrine kinin system. Okay, uh, which are key mediators of inflammation and also attacking the pathogen and containing the pathogen in the case of the coagulation factors. Okay, then the final thing that happens in type 2 activation of endothelial cells is that you start expressing molecules which are also going to help uh, recruit uh, leukocytes. So this is where it changes. Initially, when endothelial cells are first um, well, when they first undergo type 2 activation, they start producing uh, molecules which are involved in the recruitment of uh, neutrophils. Okay, so there we saw from type 1 activated endothelial cells that uh, you put on your surface P-selectin and you've also got platelet activating factor and that that occurs extremely rapidly because the P-selectin already existed in the viable play bodies and platelet activating factor is made extremely rapidly. Whereas in type 2 activation you're going to make both of these um, molecules that are going to be involved in recruiting the neutrophils. So you're going to start making a new protein known as E-selectin Okay, so this is E-selectin, and you're also going to start making a um, chemokine protein known as CXCL8. Okay, so I'll write this down here. So CXCL8 stands for CXC chemokine ligand 8. So it's uh, within the family of chemokines, and in the family of chemokines there are four different families, the CC chemokines, the CXC chemokines, uh, the C chemokines, and the CX3C chemokines. Now the CXC and the CC chemokines are the main types of chemokines, uh, but um, there are those other two as well. And this is one, uh, a very important CXC chemokine. So this name stands for CXC chemokine ligand 8. Okay, and um, CXC chemokine ligand 8 is a very small molecule. It's generally around 8 to 10 kilodaltons in size. And they're not integral membrane proteins, so they're not, um, uh, they're not suspended within the membrane. Instead, they're going to be put on the surface of the cell by attaching them to uh, the glycocalyx, basically. So what is the glycocalyx? Well, I'm highlighting it in green here, but what actually is it? Well, basically, on the surface of all endothelial cells in your body, you have what's known as the glycocalyx, okay? And this is basically polysaccharide molecules that are, um, well, they're, they're put on the surface, so they're attached to proteins that are on the, in the membrane of the endothelial cell, and then they're just lying on the surface of the cell. Okay, now one of the key polysaccharides that is within the glycocalyx is heparan sulfate. And often people uh, call it heparan sulfate proteoglycan. Now the word proteoglycan means that 
you are a polysaccharide, so glycan implies that you are a polysaccharide, but you are attached to proteins. So basically, if you can imagine having something like this, so if this is the membrane, then you've got proteins within the membrane, and these are integral membrane proteins, and then you've got your polysaccharide attached to the integral membrane proteins, and therefore lying on the surface of um, the endothelial cell. That's what a heparan sulfate proteoglycan is. It's attached to the proteins, but it is a polysaccharide. Okay, so what you're now going to do is effectively stick your CXCL8 chemokine on the surface of the glycocalyx. So you're going to attach it to this polysaccharide, like so. So this is our CXCL8, and uh, and this is uh, the usual way of attaching chemokines to the surface of endothelial cells. Okay, and by the way, CXCL8 is also known as interleukin-8, so IL-8. Okay, so it's on the surface of uh, the endothelial cell. Okay, now we'll continue this discussion uh, where we'll look at the ligands, well, the things that E-selectin and uh, CXCL8 are going to bind to on the neutrophils uh, in the next video.